Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. I welcome you all to the weekly explained session. As you know, every Friday at 8 p.m. we come here before you to bring in some of the most important topics that have been in the news in the past week or so and are extremely relevant for the UPSC examination. As you know, in the past week, there has been a lot of debate about the BBC documentary and the government's action in banning that documentary. You also know that as a student of the UPSC who is preparing for the IAS examination, rather than going into detail of what the documentary says, should it be banned, should it not be banned, for us it is much more relevant to study and understand the debate whether or not Article 19, that is the freedom to speech and expression should be given a priority or whether these kind of things should be banned by the government if the government has enough reasons to believe that it is harming the national security or the sovereignty of India. This is what we'll be discussing in this explained session today, the debate about Article 19 versus the ban culture. Without any further ado, let's see what do we have at our hand. Now, the BBC documentary being banned by the government of India, as you know, is not the first instance of government taking such an action. In the past few years, we have seen the government of India actually putting a ban on a number of things for various reasons. Some act reasons include that it is hurting the sovereignty of the country. Some other reasons include that it is causing harm to public order. It is causing animosity. It might lead to certain violence. Because of all these reasons, a lot of things have been banned in India, including movies, plays, books, the list is very, very long. Although we have a very, very short memory and we tend to believe that it is only the present government that is banning things. But if you actually see, India has had a long history of movies, of documentaries, books, etc. being banned. Whenever any documentary brings out or criticizes the people who are in the ruling party, they usually see such kind of action. It has happened over many years. This is not the first or the last instance. That is why the debate about Article 19, the freedom to express yourself versus the government's right to decide what will be displayed on the television or not is a long and old debate. The interesting part is, we often say that in India, our level of tolerance is very low. We often say that, look at the Western nations, they allow everything, everything is allowed there, nothing is banned. Why are we only banning things in India? But the reality is slightly different. In fact, the cancel culture has originated in the Western media only. Cancel culture that you see even today means that if you don't like something, if you don't agree with something, either boycott it or you ban it or you force the people to cancel it. There have been many, many, many things that have been cancelled because of this in the Western world as well. Anyone who speaks against the common notion that many people hold, those people are then forced to take back either their book or their movies or documentaries. For example, all of you I'm sure would have heard J.K. Rowling, the person behind the Harry Potter books. In Jan 2020, she was criticized, why? Because she was actually making certain comments against or in favor of transphobic. So basically, she was speaking against the LGBTQ community. And for that, she was criticized. People said that her show should be canceled, her book should be canceled, so on and so forth. And this is a very, very common theme. You see, whenever any movies now come in, for some reason or the other, people's old comments or certain scenes or certain other kind of excuses are then put out in order to start this campaign to boycott certain things. Now, does it have an impact? Does it not have an impact? It's a separate debate altogether. But the fact is that the cancel culture or the culture where people start speaking up against these things does not exist just in India. It exists in nations around the world. Now, if you focus on the present action taken by the government, it is also important for us as the UPSC aspirants to understand which law is it that allows the government of India to take such an action. At the end of the day, we are a country that is run by the rule of law. So the government cannot randomly decide what to ban, what not to ban based on its own understanding. 
it has to be based on certain laws. So the government has used certain laws under which this BBC documentary has been banned. Those come under the IT rules of 2021. Now, in many newspaper headlines, you would see this, that government has used its emergency powers under IT rules 2021. Please don't believe that these emergency powers are related to Article 352 or something like that. No, that is entirely different. When we see emergency powers under IT rules of 2021, what it really means to say is the IT rules empower the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. So MIB here, let me write it. Stands for Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. So these IT rules allow the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting to have the decision making power over whether they want to take down certain content on social media, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, etc. You would have also seen that this is not very, uh, this is not very odd for the government. In fact, Every few months we see this kind of news that government has banned certain YouTube channels, government has banned certain website. This is a very common kind of an action taken from the side of the government. Whenever the government believes that there is certain YouTube channel, certain media content that is spreading information to incite violence, that is spreading false information, it is very common for the government to ban those. That does not really invite a lot of debate. Just because it is a proper, complete documentary by the BBC, that is why the debate is much, much larger. Now, what does the rules say? The rules say verbatim, in case of emergency nature, the secretary of the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting may, if he is satisfied that it is necessary or expedient and justifiable for blocking for public access any information through any computer, that decision can be taken. The most interesting part here is it can be done without giving an opportunity of hearing. Now, this is again very, very important. There are two things that you have to understand here. First, who is a decision making authority? Who has a right to issue this order that this, this, that this content will not be displayed, that this content should be banned? The power to do that is with the Secretary of Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, means an IAS officer. You all know that the IAS officers, especially in these cases, don't act on their own discretion. They act on the orders, they act on the advice given by the minister. So obviously the minister would have passed on the message and the secretary would have signed on the official file to take this decision. The second most important thing is at the very end, without giving an opportunity of hearing. Now what does this mean? See, if you look at the concept of natural justice, theory of natural justice, in very simple terms, if there is any case against someone, you have to give the person the opportunity to present their side of the story as well. For example, if someone told you that I did something wrong, you cannot punish me without at least listening to my side of the story. Maybe I have a different reasoning for it. Maybe my intention was something else. But in this case, the government has so much powers in their hand that they can issue such kind of notification to ban or take down content without even giving an opportunity to be heard. This power will be used by the Ministry of Information Broadcasting for certain specific reasons. What are the reasons? First reason, if it impacts the sovereignty of India, integrity of India, defense of India, security of India, friendly relations with foreign states, public order, etc. So it's a very wide ranging excuses that can be given for taking down such kind of things. And these are also used by the government to take down YouTube channels or Twitter pages, etc. that are inciting violence amongst the common people. So it is not very odd. The odd part here is without having even being given the opportunity of being heard, this order can be given and this order in fact has been given. And that is why it is inviting even more criticism from people who are criticizing the government and for people who are the advocates of free speech. They think that this has given almost unlimited power to the government to decide what will be displayed to people, what will not be displayed to the people. Now, I don't know how many of you have read this. In the last week, there was one more very interesting news. That news was government of India 
had in fact proposed a new rule under which the government authority shall decide which news is fake and which news is not fake. That was a proposed amendment that the government had introduced recently. That the government agency, the government authority has a right to decide which news is considered as a fake news and which is real news. Based on that judgment, it will be decided whether certain news has to be displayed on television or whether certain news should not be caught on television. That also was seen as an attempt of the government to decide what will people see. After a lot of criticism, that was taken back. But you do see the direction in which this debate is going. Now, this BBC action, is it the first time that something like this has happened? No, absolutely not. As I told you, every few months, you keep on hearing these kind of debates. You keep on hearing this that the government has banned this YouTube channel, that channel, that magazine, that book. Let me share with you certain instances. December 2021, the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting blocked 20 YouTube channels and websites for spreading anti-India propaganda and fake news. If you actually see these kind of YouTube channels, it is actually right that they are banned because they spread a lot of fake news. They will use thumbnails which force the people to click. They're called clickbaits. They will be using such kind of headlines or title in the video that you will be forced to click just to see what exactly is this. When you go inside of the video, when you see, they spread a lot of fake news. For example, they'll say the government has decided that now they will, uh, they will put to prison anyone who is not abiding by the government. The government has decided that a certain community of people will have to be killed. These kind of fake news are spread. And we have seen how dangerous fake news can be. We have seen so many incidents of people getting killed because of fake news. There were incidents when, for example, a WhatsApp message starts to spread. A WhatsApp message that might start as a joke, that might start as a fake news, saying that people are being killed or these community people are being killed or there are certain people who have actually kidnapped a child. And then when the police or when anyone recognizes these common people on the street, they start hitting them, they start beating them and people have been killed just on the basis of these forwarded messages in India. So fake news can actually be very, very detrimental. It can be very, very dangerous. A few years back, in fact, there was a fake news that started spreading on WhatsApp messages that there are communal rights that are happening in Bangalore, that people who are not from Bangalore, who have come in from outside Bangalore, they are being killed, they are being attacked. And we saw thousands and lakhs of people all of a sudden rushing to the railway station just to leave Bangalore. It has happened in the past in multiple parts of the country. So when you say that the government should not ban these things or government should not control what media is actually doing, there has to be a limit on that because if that information is spreading and it is actually harming the lives of the people, it has to be curtailed in some way. Jan 21, 2022, again 35 YouTube channels were blocked, two Instagram accounts were blocked for spreading anti-India fake news, again very common. Feb 2022, again the government banned this. Usually, when you actually see these kind of actions being taken, it's not surprising that when you see from where are these YouTube channels running, who is running these channels, usually you will see the channels actually run in from Pakistan. So it is from Pakistan that those YouTube channels are usually running, trying to spend fake, false news into India. However, that is not always the case. Like in April 2022, 22 YouTube-based news channels is what they call them, but banned. For the first time ever, these YouTube accounts were from India as well. Because see, at the end of the day, the sad reality is people are now willing to do anything to go ahead and get certain likes. In this race of likes, in this race of having more followers, you want to give out content that no one else is giving you. For example, if you also tell the same old story that everyone else is telling on the news channel. Why would someone come to your YouTube channel or come to your Instagram page? If you want to hook people to your Instagram page, if you want to hook people to your YouTube channel, the easiest way for that is to start a controversy, is to start spreading fake news. 
That is what these YouTube channels have been accused of and the government has taken action against them. April 2022 again, the government banned certain channels. Then again, just a few months back in September, based on input of intelligence agencies, some news channels were banned because they were spreading hate among the religious communities. So these kind of actions against the BBC documentary that we see have happened in the past also, mostly against these YouTube channels. Now, the question is, what does this law say? Can you appeal against this? If let's say the government decided to ban the BBC documentary, can the BBC go ahead and appeal against the government decision? What is the way out of this? The law has been made in such a manner that it gives a lot of powers to the government. For example, the law says if, let's say I put out a post on Facebook, on Twitter, and Facebook or Twitter decided to take it down, not the government. Nothing has happened from the side of the government. Let's assume I put a post on Facebook, I put a post on Twitter, and they think it is fake news. They think that I am trying to do something bad, and they bring it down. In that case, I will have 15 days of time to actually raise a dispute. So I'll start a dispute 15 days, but if the social media platform has taken it down, not the government, but in this case, what has happened? The BBC documentary, for example, that has been banned by the government of India, it has not been taken out by those platforms. YouTube has not taken it down. Other platforms have not taken it down. It is the government of India that has ordered them. So when the government is involved, then in that case, there is no appeal that is involved here. This is the interesting part. The law does not offer any way of appeal. The law does not offer any option. If the government has decided to take down the content, we discussed just a few minutes back. Number one, the government can take down content without even giving an opportunity to be heard. So it's not like the government will invite a representation from your side tell us your side of the story, nothing like that. The government can go ahead, ban it if they think that this is harming sovereignty, national security, or foreign relations with some other nations. They don't have to stop. Also, if the government has done that, you cannot have any appeal against the government. So what can you do? The only option that remains is you can go to the court. You can appeal in the court and say that the government is taking away my fundamental right. Why? Article 19, again, this is where the debate now starts. Article 19 gives you right to freedom of speech and expression. So you can say the government is stopping me from expressing myself. So you can go to the court. Now, the tricky part here is when you go to the court, you have to first know the reason why the government has banned it. There is a long list of reasons under which the government can ban whatever you have made. Unless you really know what is the point using which the government has banned the documentary or banned my content, how will you go to the court and what will you argue in the court? This is a big, big loophole in favor of the government. Because the government's decision is usually confidential. Because it is a confidential decision, you will not even get to know how and why has the government banned it. Since you would not know why the government has banned it, it becomes even more difficult for you to go and appeal this in the court. So on one hand, yes, you can go and appeal. But on the other hand, do not expect a lot of relief from the court because you would not even know the reason why it is actually being challenged. So the law in short, under the IT rules of 2021, has been formulated in such a way that it gives almost a free hand to the government to decide which content is good enough to be circulated, which content is good enough or safe enough for the people to see. And if the government thinks that certain content should not be there on the platform, they can remove it. And there is not much that you can do about it. You can go to the court, hope for the best, but there is not much option that you have. Now coming to the big debate. This ban culture, does it violate Article 19 or not? All of you in Indian polity have read about fundamental rights. All of you know about Article 19. Article 19 has multiple parts. The one part that we are mostly focused on is right to freedom of speech and expression. Now there are different ways to look at it. The first basic fact to understand is the fundamental rights that we have 
are not absolute in nature. Meaning that most of the fundamental rights that have been given to us in the constitution come with certain restrictions. Those restrictions apply to article 19 as well, to freedom of speech and expression as well, and those apply to other fundamental rights as well. For example, you have the right to freedom of movement under article 19 only. But you do see what happened at the time of lockdown when the COVID-19 pandemic was a part of our lives. The government announced a lockdown. The government told everyone you cannot leave your house, you have to stay inside, don't go out, etc. You can say it is a violation of your fundamental right. The government is stopping your freedom of movement. That is right. But the government is within its right to do that because that will be in the interest of the public. Because if you go outside, you will be harming your life and others' lives as well. There are various examples of how freedom of movement can be curtailed. You saw how when people were returning from airports, they were COVID tested going on. If they were found to be positive, they were isolated. They were told that you have to be quarantined. Similarly, with the right to freedom of speech and expression also, there are certain restrictions that can be imposed. Yes, there are different types of restrictions. The judiciary usually decides whether the re restrictions are reasonable or not. The debate of reasonability has often been at the center of this debate. There cannot be non-reasonable restrictions. There cannot be restrictions without any reason. The, re the restrictions have to be reasonable. Whether they are reasonable or not, the judiciary decides. On the other hand, the people who believe in freedom of speech and expression, the people who say we are liberal, they believe that if you allow the government to take down any content that they want, to take down any content that they think is against the society, it will actually lead to a situation where the government controls everyone's life where the government controls how the people will start living. Many examples are given. Let's go back to the British era. When the British were here, they realized the fact that in order to control the population, in order to ensure that people don't start protesting against the British, they would have to control the press. You all know how British tried to control Indian press by bringing in a lot of laws on the Vernacular Press Act to all these laws where the local language newspapers first had to take permission from the government to tell them or to decide what to print, what not to print. Such kind of situations have happened because the government wants to have a control over what people will do, what people will not do. The same happened during national emergency in India when we had the Indira Gandhi government where the newspapers were not ready or not free to print whatever they want. So yes, you do have to give slight powers to the government so that the law and order is not compromised. But on the other hand, if the government gets a free hand to decide what is good for the country, what is bad for the country, then you will have a situation where if anyone criticizes the government, if anyone speaks out even against a government policy, you will see that those posts, those articles, those movies, those documentaries are taken out of circulation. And it has happened in the past as well. I'll suggest you search about something called Kissa Kursi Ka. Kissa Kursi Ka was a movie actually made on the life of Indira Gandhi, her son Sanjay Gandhi that was banned by the Congress government. That was banned because they said that it is showing uh, the Prime Minister and her son in a bad light. So as I told you, this is not the first time or the first government that is going ahead and trying to ban things which seem to be not in favor of the government. But it has been a kind of a culture that has happened in India, India pa in the past as well. It is the Western nation that also do the same. There has to be a balance that has to be placed between the freedom of expression and the government's power to take down these kind of contents. Now, it is not just about the government deciding to take down certain content or certain documentaries. There are other ways as well in which the government has tried to curtail the freedom of speech and expression. For example, look at the internet shutdowns in India. By any stretch of imagination, India is the world's leader when it comes to internet shutdowns. Internet shutdown means when the government has ordered an internet services should be shut down in a certain area, certain city, certain state. 
it is usually done when the government believes that social media or internet is being used to incite violence to bring to spread messages to large number of people to collect people at a certain area this internet shutdown activity or the decision to shut down the internet has also been criticized but the government has stuck to it as you can see here india is by far the country that actually shuts down the internet for its people for a long long time now there are two ways to look at it number one yes there is a need to do that because we have seen how technology has been misused how thousands and lakhs of people can be given some information or fake information at just one click on the other hand you also know that internet usage has become so fundamental part of our lives that you now cannot imagine a life without it just imagine you would not have been seeing me without the internet just imagine your preparation of upsc without the internet now just imagine the same when we see our internet shutdowns let's say in jammu and kashmir in that state also there would have been many people preparing for the upsc examination so if they all of a sudden are told that no your internet is shut down how would their preparation be impacted how would their day to life would be impacted so internet shutdown again has been at the center of this debate does the government have the power to shut down internet which has become so 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 integral part of our lives whenever they want or <coughs> sorry should the government not restrict the freedom of expression that people have now supreme court also in fact has come into the picture when it comes to internet shutdowns supreme court thankfully has been a big supporter of freedom of speech and expression in the past few years and we'll discuss a few examples as well the supreme court for example hearing matters on internet shutdowns has said that freedom of speech and expression is constitutionally protected now the interesting part is when you read about our fundamental rights most of them have not been given in a lot of detail most of them have just been given in very small portions supreme court judgments and conventions later on have expanded the fundamental rights you talk about article 21 it has been expanded so widely by the supreme court a lot of things have been included in it similarly freedom of speech and expression in india in our constitution the right of media has not been mentioned in the constitution anywhere it is just a convention it is the supreme court that has said okay right to media or right of media to publish will also be a part of article 19 only although it is not mentioned anywhere so freedom to express yourself is a very wide right it includes writing articles making videos publishing books making movies documentaries all of that is a part of the freedom of expression that people have the supreme court also said any order from authority suspending the internet is subject to judicial review meaning that if the government gives an order to ban or to let's say shut down internet or even to ban documentary such as these it will be open to judicial review meaning that you still have the right to approach the supreme court if you want to appeal against that decision supreme court also has said section 144 cannot be used to suppress legitimate expression of opinion section 144 means when you are told that you cannot assemble at a place so don't assemble when more than four people cannot assemble this is used when the government does not want people coming together and criticizing the government raising a movement on the ground etc review the need for continuance or existing order pass under this section the government of india has also been told by supreme court that you cannot for example just ban internet for a long period of time you have to review the need to continue this or not repetitive orders under article or the section 144 would be an abuse of power the governments usually use section 144 when they see that a lot of people against them for example have come out on the roads demanding something article 144 stops people from legally assembling at one single place so supreme court has been putting forward certain ideas in favor of article 19 in favor of freedom of speech and expression or in freedom favor of freedom to assemble as well but again the government also has been using their powers time and time again and making new laws to give them more power 
this is what article 19 is and i'm sure all of you are aware of this although usually we only talk about freedom of speech and expression but article 19 has other components as well it allows you to assemble peacefully without arms it allows you to form association as well it allows you freedom of movement move freely throughout the union of india you can also settle or reside and also you can practice any profession but as i told you these have their own restrictions i'll give you an example as well let's see this one the right to practice any profession now <clears throat> when the government of india or when the constituent assembly made the constitution they did not realize that writing this would be problematic they just wrote okay you can practice any profession so what happened was they soon realized let's say i put up a board outside my house that i am a doctor i can do surgeries i can see patients as well why because i have the right to profession i can follow any profession that we want so government soon realized oh we at least have to write that some professions would require licenses some professions would require special permission from the government for example right now if you want to open up a medical store you need to have a license from the government if you want to become a doctor you need to or if you want to practice you have to first get a degree and then you can start your practice so government by time and time again has been putting certain restrictions certain conditions on all of these including the freedom of speech and expression as well these restrictions have also been written in the constitution itself the same article 19 also says that these restrictions or they shall be reasonable restrictions that will be imposed now if a restriction has been imposed whether it is reasonable or not is decided by the judiciary if a question is asked so restrictions can be imposed everyone agrees whether the restrictions are reasonable or not if there is a question on it the supreme court is the one that will decide what are the reasons or what are the factors that will be considered for putting certain restrictions if it is against the sovereignty and integrity of india if it harms the security of india if it harms friendly relation with our foreign nations public order decency morality defamation incitement all of these can be reasons for which your freedom given to you under article 19 can be curtailed <clears throat> under this the government has banned movies has banned books paintings etc all of that has been done as i told you this is a very old debate what comprises accusation as compared to what comprises a fact being told to the people government for example has also said that many people gave hate speeches many people have been misusing their power and usually this is very interesting in respect of whichever party is in power when anyone in power gives such a speech that is ignored when people who are not in power they give such a speech which can be considered as a hate speech that is usually not taken very lightly by the government so definition of hate speech also changes depending upon who is in power who is not in power the freedom of press also is said to be curtailed by the government because the government now decides what news will be published what news will not be published and many people have spoken up against that as well former supreme court lawyer very famous lawyer ag nurani famously said intolerance of dissent from orthodoxy of the day has been the bane of indian society for centuries it is precisely in the ready acceptance of right to dissent as distinct from its mere tolerance that a free society distinguishes itself in simple terms what he means to say is the mark of a good developed established society is a society where people are allowed to speak their minds even if they are speaking against the government if you have read about political thinkers you all might have read about js mill for example js mill very famously propagated that the freedom of speech and expression should not be curtailed at any cost js mill famously said that even if one single person even if one single person in the entire population has an idea which is against the government or has an idea which is against the majority even then that one single person should be allowed to speak his or her mind rather than actually being forced not to speak 
these kind of examples have been given in the past. But the problem here is simple. How do you decide whether if someone is making a speech that it is just a criticism of the government or is it a attempt to incite violence? This is where the fine line actually lies. If it is a person making a speech with an attempt to incite violence, it has to be banned, it has to be taken down. On the other hand, if the person is not inciting violence, if the person is just criticizing the government on its policies, if the person is just criticizing the government on its approach, then that should not be taken down. But who decides that? That is still a key question that has not been answered by anyone. This freedom of expression has also been misused by many people and by the government as well. Government, for example, has still been using the sedition law. Now, the law of sedition is simple. It says that if you are involved in anti-India or anti-national activities, then sedition will be imposed on you. But the problem here is, anti-India doesn't really mean that you cannot criticize the government. Criticizing the government is absolutely fine. In a democracy, in fact, the democracy cannot be safe, cannot be strong until you have the right to criticize the government. I should be allowed to go ahead and say I don't like a certain government policy. I should be allowed to go ahead and say that I do not like how the government is working. I should not be fearful that if I say this, what will happen to me? If I say this, I will be punished. If I say this, action will be taken against me. The problem is now we have blurred the lines between nation and the government. Going, speaking against the government is fine. It is allowed. Speaking against the nation is a problem. Sedition law was introduced by the British to censor the freedom fighters so that they should not be allowed to criticize the government. But the same has been used or misused by the government even today. The government has also been misusing the censorship acts. As I told you, there has been a long history in India where if you make certain media, if you make certain videos, if you make certain news channels, etc., books that criticize the government, that criticize the people in power, you might have to face censorship. Censorship laws should be strict, should strictly define what is allowed, what is not allowed. But the problem is, in many cases, it almost gives a free hand to the government to decide what content do they want to be in the public domain and what content do they not want to allow. Internet ban, we have already discussed about this. How India is the one country that has a distinction of having the largest number of internet shutdowns in the entire country. The debate for internet shutdowns now is not just about the freedom of speech and expression. It is so important that many countries even believe that right to internet should even be a fundamental right. The reason being very simple. When you talk about right to life, let's say Article 21, Supreme Court has also said right to life is not just about living, it's not just about breathing. Right to life is also about the fact that you need to have a good quality life. It is about the fact that the people should be allowed to live a fulfilling life. People should be allowed to have whatever they want for having a basic amenities at par with everyone else. Internet has become so distinct in our life, it has become such an important part of our life that in order to become even normal lives, you need internet right now. I just gave you an example, you are preparing for UPSC, someone else is preparing for UPSC and they face an internet shutdown, obviously their lives would be impacted. That is why even internet ban orders have been considered as a misuse of the government's power to go ahead and ban these kind of things. Now, <clears throat> There have been some attempts from the side of the government in the past to give a proper definition of what shall be hate speech, what kind of speeches would be banned, what should not be banned. But again, the problem is that the implementation of these kind of laws is still not very good. For example, the 267th report of the Law Commission said that hate speech can be defined as an incitement to hatred primarily against a group of people defined in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religious beliefs and the like. I would advise you to remember this definition because words such as these hate speech etc are easy to understand but very difficult to define. 
If I ask you what is the definition of hate speech, you might not find it very easy to actually put it down on the paper in one or two lines. The law commission has given this definition, but again, the implementation still is not very clear. The implementation still varies from case to case, and that is why it has been open to different interpretations in the past as well. There have been certain limitations on right to freedom of speech expression, as we have discussed. In fact, the Constituent Assembly itself was in favor of this, and that is why they made it a part of Article 19. As we discussed in Article 19, subsection 2, we specifically have the restrictions that can be imposed on freedom of speech and expression. The interesting part is, there are some constitutions which do not have these restrictions. If you look at the American constitution, America prides itself in being a very liberal country. It prides itself in being a country where anyone can speak whatever they want, although it is also fast changing. If you look at the American constitution, these restrictions are not seen in the American Constitution. Although we were inspired by the American Constitution, but these restrictions are not really seen in the American Constitution as well. Another interesting part is in the American Constitution, the freedom of media is also specifically mentioned. There is no explicit mention of freedom of media to publish or to express themselves in the Indian Constitution. It is considered as an implicit part of Article 19. But the American Constitution specifically talks about the freedom of media as well. So there are some other countries that are actually much, much more liberal that have not put any restrictions. But even in those countries, you do see certain instances of government using its executive power where they actually ban certain things from happening. There are very few countries around the world where you can say that the government allows 100% freedom of speech and expression because at the end of the day, the government's primary responsibility is towards its citizens to maintain a law and order, to ensure that there is no violence being imposed upon them. And if in order to achieve that, they have to impose certain restrictions, if in order to achieve that, they have to ban certain things, it is right for the government to go ahead and do that as well. There's one other interesting part I wanted to touch before we end this. Article 19 has been in the debate for various reasons. It usually remains in the debate about this decision of the government, whether government can ban certain things or not. But interestingly, just a few weeks back, it was actually in the news in the Supreme Court as well. The fact that I want to share is, Supreme Court recently had said that Article 19 is so, so, so important that it will be available against private citizens as well. Now, as you know, fundamental rights usually, by definition, are a protection given to us against the action of the government. Fundamental rights tell us what the government cannot do against us. Government cannot discriminate, government cannot, for example, take away our freedom of religion, those sorts of things. However, very few fundamental rights, such as right against untouchability, for example, the right against exploitation, these were the only few rights that were available against private citizens as well. But now the Supreme Court has said Article 19 is available against private citizens as well. Meaning that now, even if a private citizen who is not a part of the government, who is not considered as a state, even if a private citizen tries to curtail your freedom of speech and expression, even against that private citizen, now you have the right to approach the Supreme Court. So this also indicates that even the Supreme Court takes our Article 19, our freedom of speech and expression, very, very, very seriously. Their decision when it comes to internet shutdowns, Supreme Court decision on the misuse of Section 144 and also Supreme Court decision to expand the scope of Article 19. All of these indicate the fact that the Supreme Court takes it very, very, very seriously that Article 19 for the citizens of India should be safeguarded and it remains to be seen whether the government's frequent actions against Article 19 are called out by the Supreme Court or not. This is the discussion that we wanted to have with you about whether Article 19 should be given priority 
or whether the government has the right to curtail Article 19 in the interest of the larger section of the society. The debate, as you know, is still not settled. It's an open debate. It's an ongoing issue. And as everyone else also believes, there has to be a balance between the two. But it is easier to say this. The difficult part is how to achieve that balance, how to make sure the governments don't misuse this power and they only use it for the interest of the country. Thank you so much for joining us for this explained session. If you have still not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please make sure to do hit the subscribe button. You can also become part of Telegram channel if you have not done so till now. Please do that by using the link given in the description of the video and also comment and let us know how did you find this discussion and what other topics would you like us to discuss in the upcoming explained sessions which come in here every single week, Friday at 8 p.m. Thank you so much. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.